Welcome to How to Make It in the City on WBAI in New York 99.5 FM. This is a show where we explore both the practical and spiritual aspects of making it. This show is for artists, entrepreneurs, dreamers, and visionaries who are determined to end the cycle of working soul-crushing jobs just to pay bills. This is where we learn how to live our mission while making a great living. This is where we learn how to do well by doing good. This is where we learn how to step into our divine calling while entering a space of financial freedom and abundance. I am your host, Ama Kari Kari Yawson. In August of 2015, I quit my six-figure salary day job as a corporate lawyer to step into my purpose of healing through storytelling. I now travel the country performing my stories, such as my debut book, Sune's Gift, while facilitating presentations and training sessions for schools, universities, governments, and corporations. Loved ones, it has been quite a bumpy ride, and I have a long way to go. Let's figure out how to make it in this city together. During this session, we are going to learn how to become more profitable artists. We are rejecting the notion of the starving artist. No, 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 no. And embracing the idea that art provides value to the world and artists deserve to be handsomely compensated and rewarded for that value. How do we create art that truly matters while making a great living? To help us with this question, we have Michael L. Royce, who is the director of the New York Foundation for the Arts. Michael L. Royce serves as executive director for the New York Foundation for the Arts, established in 1971 as an independent organization to serve individual artists throughout the state. The mission of the New York Foundation for the Arts is to empower emerging artists and arts organizations across all disciplines at critical stages in their creative lives and professional development. In 2009, it extended its programs and services throughout the United States and the international community. NIFA's flagship program includes fiscal sponsorship for the arts, online resources such as NIFA classifieds, learning and professional development, and awards and cash grants. Welcome, Michael L. Royce. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's a gorgeous day. <laughs> it is. It is. It is a beautiful day in New York. We are very happy with the weather, and we're happy to be serving the WBAI community today. So, Michael, please tell us about your journey with respect to becoming a leader of a major arts foundation. Certainly. I mean, first, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, it's really important, I think, for there to be a community of conversations around what it is to be an artist and what it means to work in an arts organization. So I'm always deeply appreciative when I have an opportunity to connect with my community. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for calling me a leader. Um, so I've been asked that question a lot, and depending upon how much time there is, I go into great detail. But <laughs> okay. uh, I think, you know, since it normally takes about an hour because it's a very long journey, uh, what I would like to say here and what I want to honor is that I got very lucky. Mm. Uh, people took chances on me, and I work very hard to honor those chances. My career, I would say, has not been about the journey of the I, but it's been about the journey of the we. It does indeed take a village, and if it weren't for the village, I wouldn't be where I am today. And just to give some examples, it took a junior high school teacher who let me cry on her shoulders a lot. It took a friend who paid my rent for one year, so that I could go back to school after I dropped out of NYU. It took a college dean to fight for my acceptance into a junior year abroad program so that I could learn about international economics and finance. It took a complete stranger to get me a job I wasn't qualified for. It took a council general to mentor me with corporate skills I didn't have. It took a very wealthy individual to provide access to contacts that were beyond my reach, and that it goes on and on and on. And so each day is a gift, 
and I worked very hard in my career because I owe so much to so many. And I think I'll leave it at that. What a touching, touching response. I also want to touch on one point because I think I would be remiss if I did not say this. You also have thankfully been able to receive. Yes. Now, very often people who receive offers of such gifts and are filled with such lack of worthiness and lack of confidence that they actually reject the gifts. But for you to allow someone to pay your rent for a whole year and say, no, I'm not going to just hustle and not go to school and work instead of going to school, even though this is a great opportunity so that I can contribute my half. But for you to allow that to happen and graciously say, thank you. I accept this, I appreciate this, and I will forever be grateful. That takes something that I think is not celebrated in our society and our culture. So I want all the audience members to please take note of that because I'm taking note of that and being a better receiver is something I'm working on on a personal level. I also am very interested in you dropping out of school. Mm -hmm. When did you drop out? How did you drop out? I think it's very important because many people are listening who kind of believe that everyone who has now reached a position of stature had some very direct path that was somehow paved with beauty and gold and sunshine. And so for you as an executive director of a major arts foundation to say, I dropped out of school, I had to go back, it means something. So please tell us a little about that. Sure. Um in short, a uh, violent crime was committed against me. Oh, my God. So I was not able to function. Mm. And so I needed to drop out because I couldn't think or focus. You were traumatized. I was traumatized. Yes. How long did it take you to recoup to be able to return? Uh, so I would say that I drifted for five years. That would mm. be the term I would use. Yes. And uh, it took a long time to just, I had to sleep a lot. Okay. I had to cry a lot. Yes. Uh, I had to walk the city a lot on my own. Mm. And eventually I thought, okay, it's time to get back up out of bed and face the world again. And be, build your life. And make a life. Yeah. I, I'm so appreciative. And thank you so much for sharing. Audience members, are we hearing that? Many of us have experienced traumatic experiences in our lives. And there are many ways that our lives can go after those experiences. We can drift for 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. Uh, but at some point, prayfully, we make the decision that life has to go on and we have to rebuild. And the New York arts community is grateful that you made that choice because now we are being blessed by that choice. So thank you. were you ever an artist yourself? Yeah, so when I went to NYU, I went to the Tisch School of the Arts, and yes. I studied acting. Okay, great. So you are an actor as well. Wonderful. No longer. <laughs> I haven't been on the stage in probably 30 years. Really? Okay, well, at least you have the appreciation for the arts, which helps with your executive directorship of NYFA. So tell us, when you were taking the job, as you were getting into the arts community, what was driving you? What do you believe the arts does for us? as a people, how does it serve society? Why are you so interested in this? Well, I think that the arts are in fact society. I don't think you can have society without the arts. They're one and the same. They're one and the same. And I think that without the arts, we would have no way to respond to the beauty and the chaos in our civilization. And without artists, we would have nobody to inspire us to the actualization of ourselves. And so for me, artists, they help us confront, mm -hmm. they provoke, and they invite us to question things from a different perspective. And I've always called artists our noble warriors because they make something out of nothing every day. And to do that uh, to makes, takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. for them to do that because if they tap into that courage, then their works are extraordinarily powerful for the civilian, which would be someone like me. Yes. And I think we are all in this together, the artist and the civilian, and when you, put, again, it, just as the journey is a we journey, civilization is a we experience. And so the arts are, in fact, society. You don't even separate them. I no. greatly appreciate that. In the self-help community, there's a lot about creative visualization and the idea that we can be who we want to be when we create vision boards, when we say, I am, like, let's say I want to be a millionaire, and I say, I am a millionaire, I am a millionaire, and I see, show a picture of myself, I guess, looking at my bank statement with a million dollars. That's very, very common in the Tony Robbins world, the secret, et cetera. And I agree with you that I think the role of the artist is to create that creative visualization for societal level. So the Peanuts creator, 
put a black character in the Peanuts show or cartoon at a time when segregation was everywhere. But that served as creative visualization to say, hey, we can have integrated societies. So I appreciate your point so much that we must see artists as warriors who show us what the world can be. So art no long, not, not only reflects the world as it is, but it gives us a vision to work towards and it normalizes that vision for us so that we are able to engage in the work necessary to bring about its manifestation. So yes, please. Well, I just wanted to say that I wanted very much to head an arts organization. So I did have the vision. Yes. I put it out there for myself many years ago. Yes. And I strove for it. So I think having a vision is important. Yes. He's saying in his own life he used creative visualization. You were not a director of a major arts co foundation at some point, right? How long have you been the director? 10 years. 10 years. But before then, you did put it into the atmosphere. You did visualize yourself as such, and it manifested. So this is not just a sort of how to make it as an artist section. This is how to make it as a human being, because you use these secrets in your own life. And I think also sometimes you have to accept yourself for who you are completely. Yes. And I say that because when I went back to school, I went to a business school. Mm -hmm. And when I came out... Uh, I had a very high GPA and I thought I was going to be a master of the universe and I was going to make <laughs> millions of dollars. And I went to the career fair that they have where they have all the major corporate people behind tables and they're all wearing suits. And every time I approached a table, I actually got physically ill and I couldn't have a conversation oh, oh with the people behind the table. So I went to my guidance counselor who I had never met before and I explained the situation. I said, I just spent four years in a business school and I can't seem to have a conversation with the business community. And she said, well, Michael, with all due respects, it makes sense. I mean, we've all heard about you. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And she said, well, aren't you the person who skips down the hallway singing commercial jingles? Okay. <laughs> and I said, yes, I am, but do you have a problem with that? She said, no, I don't have a problem with that, but you're the only one in the school that does that. Oh, my goodness. Maybe you should consider a career in theater. So I had to reexamine myself and say, all right, I just, I'm just not one of them. And yes. I need to go where my soul sings, and that's in the arts. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can so relate because, as you know, I was a corporate lawyer for a long time, and I think I was a perfectly wonderful corporate lawyer. But I remember one of the partners saying to me, you have such exuberance. And she said it like it was a bad thing. <laughs> she said it like it was a bad thing, right? So obviously being a radio personality and a public speaker is a place where my exuberance is an advantage, not considered a disadvantage. So we have to go where we blossom to a certain extent, which is what you're talking about. We do. So I, I greatly, greatly appreciate that. And so your current role allows you to merge many aspects of yourself. Yes. Your love of the arts, your desire to have the arts be a vehicle for cultural transformation, but you were gifted. And this is the thing about some of us, right? I did great in law school. I did great academically, right? You did phenomenally in business school. But when, let's say, Goldman Sachs was at the career fair, your stomach was turning, just approaching the table. Right. But that academic intellect with respect to business, because that doesn't take away your great GPA, you were able to apply at NIFA in an arts environment where your soul can be at peace. Correct. And so I love perfect. reading the business pages. Yes. And I love the business community. Yes. And I love business professionals. Yes. I just don't want to be one of them. But I but I want to engage with them in a way that helps the arts. Yes. And you have the intellectual capacity for it. It's not like you saw the numbers and you fainted. You were fine with numbers. So right. this is why this is so perfect for you. So please tell us more about that. So you want NIFA to help artists who are warriors to engage in this cultural change. How is NIPA doing that? Uh, we do it through a lot of different ways. One of the things we are known for is entrepreneurial learning or entrepreneurial education. So we think that artists, if they wish to, because we believe that artists should have the gift of time to create if they have a compelling talent, and we support that with grants. But we also believe that if an artist wants to commoditize his or her work and wants to engage in the commercial world or the contemporary art market, whatever discipline he or she is in, then it's incumbent upon NIFA to give them that skill set. And so we do a lot of training on how to market yourself 
and how to brand yourself and how to use social media to your advantage and why you need to come up with your own individual strategic plan that has short-term and long-term objectives and why you need to understand about intellectual property rights, all the things that sometimes make an artist glaze over and not want to pay attention. We try to emphasize how important it is that they do do this. In fact, we wrote a book called The Profitable Artist because the title is about how to use all of these skills in your career through your technique to make money in doing something you love. Wonderful. So there are people who are listening who are saying, I need that. I need that desperately. They are saying, I need it. One, I need a grant for sure because I need to live and it's not easy. Two, I need some entrepreneurial education. Three, I need to learn how to commercialize my art. How do they literally get that from NIFA? What is the process? Uh, well, there are a lot of online courses that, I mean, you can sign up for things and then there are a lot of in-person courses, but I would start with buying the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you just go on. I think the easiest way to do it is to email the profitable artists at nifa.org uh, and ask for the book and if you say in that email that you heard it on this radio station I will give you a 20 percent discount off the cost of the book uh, start with that and then see which chapters in that book resonate with you and then investigate which arts organizations are going to serve you best in those particular areas that you need to improve on because some artists are very good mathematically yeah. Some artists are geniuses when it comes to writing their statement. Some artists are fantastic when it comes to branding themselves. Those skills you don't need, but you need all the skill sets to make it in this world. Phenomenal. So audience members, one, I think they need the email address again. Can you please repeat it? I believe it's theprofitableartist at nifa.org. Okay. So number one step. Listeners, you're listening. Thank you. I love you. One, you're going to get this book. I have the book right here in the studio with me. I got it from the library. Uh, Does it I looked say it up. The? It says The Profitable Artist. it's The artist. Profitable Artist. Okay. I couldn't okay. remember if the The was there or not. <laughs> Perfect. The Profitable Artist, a handbook for all artists in the performing literary and visual arts. So number one step is you're getting the hand on the, your hands on the book. If You've already paid for the book because you pay taxes. So you can go to the library and get it, right? Yes, you can. So <laughs> you paid for the book already, right? That's true. I, I live in Nassau County. My taxes are not playing around. I went to the Hewlett Library and got this. So number one, you can get the book from the library. If you're not that type of person, you don't want a deadline, you want to be able to mark it up, a lot of people are like that, you can email theprofitableartist at nifa.org and get your 20% discount. Oh, is it 20%? 20%. Great. 20% discount because you're going to say you heard about this by listening to WBAI show how to make it in the city you're reading the book you're figuring out your strengths your weaknesses opportunities for learning threats to your business this is called a SWOT analysis you're doing it for yourself and your business then from that you're saying hey these are my weaknesses and you're going to figure out how to get the courses you need or the support you need and NIFA can help you because NIFA has both online courses and in-person training, and they can find out about all of those on the website, nyfa.org. NYFA right, and also I want to say there are tremendous, you know, there are many great service arts organizations out there besides NIFA. Yes. So do your research, do your homework. Uh, we're not the only one. I think we do a great job, but our culture may not be the culture for you or the fit for you, so do your research. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Can you tell us about any success stories, any artists that you've helped with respect to these issues of commercializing their works and their entrepreneurial education and how it's helped? Just to make it sure. real for the audience. Um, so there's a, this remarkable woman out there named Katie Rubin. Katie, I hope you're listening. <laughs> uh, she took our, what we call our boot camp, which is our entrepreneurial learning camp for artists. And she, uh, after taking that, she's an actress, she decided she was going to found a theater company called Theater of the Oppress. And, I've heard of it. And it's doing very well. I think it's in its fifth year. Uh, it's becoming a very well-known organization. And Katie took all the skills that she learned in the experience of that NIFA gave her and applied it to this organization. And within five years, it's doing extraordinarily well. Great success story. And I've heard about this organization. I have a friend who d did a show there. Uh, and so you see how the work grows. It starts serving other people. My friend is not Katie. My friend has benefited from Katie's work and Katie has benefited from Michael's work. So it's one big loving, loving, loving circle. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So what advice do you give a young person who is listening, who 
wants to pursue a career in the arts, but is being advised not to due to parental love and parental advice. And that parental love and parental advice is coming in the form of artists don't make money. You need to make money. Get that out of your head. That's a really good question. And I'm not so sure I would disregard the parental advice. And here's why. Mm -hmm. uh, a career in the arts is not an easy one. And we need to understand that. And there is often little financial stability. Not always. But uh, often. But often. Um, and it's difficult to raise a family if you pursue an arts career. I'm very lucky. I have two amazing, extraordinary children. Um, but it's not always easy. And so I think when that parent or that cousin or that brother or that best friend express concern, as you said, it is out of love. That is what it's from. And I think it's important in considering an arts career to listen to what people say and make sure you really want it. And after listening and asking your own questions about it, if you decide that it's not for you, that's a valid answer. However, if you decide you want this career in the arts, then you have to give it everything you have. You must never give up. And I think the most important thing is to surround yourself with those that support what you're trying to do and stop worrying about pleasing other people, including your parents and those mm -hmm. that love you, and forge your own way. And if you can keep that discipline, if you can keep that focus, you will be successful. I love this advice because as someone who went from having a very stable career with the checks coming in every two weeks, I have experienced this firsthand as a mom, a married mom of two kids. It is not an easy road. And I think that very often, uh, and I laugh about this all the time, because I put all the wins on Facebook. So I put all of the great programs I'm doing at this school and that school and all the great titles and accolades I'm getting. And I think that my friends and people who are seeing that are thinking, I'm just blowing up. This is amazing. She's raking in the dough. And I laugh <laughs> to myself because if they only knew what was going on beneath the surface, the, the surface, because it's not that I lied. All of those successes are there. But one, they don't necessarily always have a monetary equivalent. And two, the bills do not wait for you right the bills we are set up in a society where that mortgage payment needs to come by this date otherwise you're getting a bad credit report otherwise they're coming to take your home that car payment better come before they come with the tow truck it is not it does not allow for you to say i'm ebbing and flowing this month is a good month because it's bullying prevention month or respect for all month and my schools are calling me to do it this month they're doing testing I'm, I'm speaking from experience here oh this year this month there's a bunch of testing they're taking ela so they're not all of that is happening and causing my income to fluctuate greatly but the bills are not waiting for that and so it's an ex exceedingly challenging road it's not for the faint of heart do not look at all of the glamour and think oh this is fine it's easy it's a piece of cake everybody else is making it because below the surface there's a lot of stress and in order for you to be willing to endure that stress you must want it really badly you must want it deeply. You may want it more than anything in the world. I have a girlfriend, my college roommate, her name is Christy. She quit her job as a corporate attorney in Chicago to become an actor. And when I told, asked her, hey, what's going on here? She said, I'm becoming an actor because it's the only thing I can do. You literally must be at that level where you're like, this is the only thing I can do that will allow me to experience this, you know, joy in the world. And so I appreciate that advice. This is not for everyone, and we have to take that seriously. And I want one Please. correction. It's profitable artists at NIFA.org. There's no the. I just found it. Oh, okay. Important. So for all everybody Even out listening. Even though the book has the It's the profitable artists at okay. NIFA.org. Important. important. And I want to say something to echo what you just said, because it just happened to a friend of mine, uh, Hey, Jeff. Uh, his name is Jeff. <laughs> and uh, he spent his whole career as a very successful facilities manager. Okay. So that's the person that takes care of all the building crises that happens whenever you're operating a building, you know, for a major corporation, a major bank. And uh, we, talk a w we took a walk in Central Park three weeks ago, uh, and he had been snatched up from that corporate bank and put into a multimedia corporation because okay. he was so good. And he'd only been there for three weeks. And during this walk, he said, you know what, Michael, I can't do this anymore. Hmm. He said, I've always wanted to be a writer my whole life. 
That's where my soul is. That's where my joy is. I just want to write. And so he, the, on Monday, he gave his notice. Wow. And he has no idea where his income is going to come from. He's open to he's open to living with his mother. He's in his forties, yeah. going back home and living on the couch. He just has to be where his soul will be at peace. And I so respect that. But it took him a long time to get there. Yes. So we don't always know yes. right away what our soul is trying to tell us. But when it does speak, pay attention to it. I can relate to his story, and I wish him God's blessings because it's not an easy road. So when these people decide, okay. This is my soul's calling. I have to do this. There is nothing else that I can do. Can you just give us some nuggets? What do they call them? Some hacks. I mean, if you can just say <laughs> from this big book, okay, because this book is big and I haven't finished reading it yet. It is like 220 pages or so. Any nuggets, hacks that you can give us to really figure out how to get the profit in it as artists, what would those hacks be? Well, okay. I'll use my own experience, not as an artist, but an arts administrator who always wanted to head an arts organization. Up until the time that I was able and fortunate enough to run an arts organization, I would tell everybody I knew that's what I wanted to do. And it always came up in every conversation, and it came up in every email I communicated, and it came up with my family. I just say, that's what I want. This is what I need. And I put it out into the universe. And a lot of people said to me, well, how are you going to make that happen? You don't have the experience. You don't have the qualifications. Because at the time I was putting out there was many years ago, and yes. I didn't have the experience or the qualifications. Yes. And I said, I don't care about that. This is what I want to do. And so I think you know the life hack is just to believe so much in the universe giving you what you want, even if it seems impossible and there's absolutely no way it will ever happen. Believe it will, and then it will. I love it. I think that there is actually also a very, very practical explanation to why your strategy worked. Closed mouths don't get fed. <laughs> they don't. And you, it, it, at every moment, we're bombarded with sensory information. And I give this in my professional development courses as an example. Have you ever been in a building and met someone and you swore up and down this is your first time you ever met this person in your life. Let's say the person's name is Sally. And for some reason, you have to be in a room with Sally and you get to talking. You're like, oh, Sally, you live, you've lived in this building for two years. I've lived in this building for three years, but I've never seen you in my entire life. Then all of a sudden, after you two have that interaction, Sally is popping up everywhere. Sally's in the laundry room. <laughs> Sally's in the hallway. Sa Sally was always there. She was just not in your consciousness but she was always there when you kept on telling people i want to be i want to run a uh, i want to run an arts organization i want to be a director you were putting this into their consciousness so when opportunities came along that would put you on that path they would tell you about it because they were fully aware of your intention if you had just mentioned it in passing here and there those signals would not have come into their minds for them to even let you know about the opportunity. But you put it out there diligently, steadily, and the opportunities came. And also because you kept on saying it, your eyes were also open to the opportunity. So it was like both you and everyone around you, the entire universe was conspiring in your favor because of your steady and diligent intention. Absolutely wonderful. So now, Please, <laughs> most of our listeners support the arts and many of them are very nervous with respect to the future of the arts in this political climate. Mm. Because although you are very aware of the great, great, great things the arts do for us, maybe some people in power are not mm. and they are defunding the National Endowment for the Arts and so forth. Mm. What can we do? What can we do to save the arts in this environment? I think we have to do this all together. There is an amazing organization called Americans for the Arts. It's based in D.C., and they've been there a long time, but they are the national organization for arts funding throughout the United States. And if you go on their website, it's very easy because of the resources they have on that website to know immediately who your elected officials are. And they actually give you examples of letters or phone calls you might want to make or who's convening where or who's protesting where. All of that is on that website. And if you really want to do something, I highly recommend going on there and letting them guide you because it's very complicated to advocate for the arts. It's about who you know. It's about what you say. 
and it's about how you say it. And that particular organization has been doing this for years, and so they can really help you fine-tune the message that you as an individual want to say and the action that you want to do as an individual into the larger scope of arts advocacy. Love it. Appreciate it. Are you listening? Americans for the Arts. We have to go on their website and we have to show our support. So it's been a phenomenal conversation. I so appreciate you. We could sit here for hours and hours talking. And I mean, your life experience alone, you should start. I hope you're working on your memoir because it sounds like it would be very interesting. So how can listeners continue to support you at your, and your work at NIFA? What can they do? Do they should they be following you on Twitter? Should they be you know following NIFA on Facebook? I mean, just to keep abreast of all right. of the great things that you're doing and all the support you're lending to artists. So if you want to be on our mailing list, if you go on the landing page, NIFA.org, it's right there at the very top. It says join our mailing list. Just click on it. And then you'll get all the information that we put out in our newspapers and our blogs. But we're also on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We're on all the social media outlets. Um, I don't have all the tags with me to say out loud, but I think if you just <laughs> Google NIFA, you'll social it. media, it'll all come up for you. Perfect, perfect. So we will indeed be doing that. Michael Elroy's, we thank you. We are grateful for your wisdom. We're grateful for your time. And we're wishing you and NIFA the best that this universe has to offer. Thank, thank you. you.
Welcome back. You are listening to How to Make It in the City on WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM. You just heard the song Fame by Irene Cara. I would like to introduce you to my next guest, Chari Arespa Kachoga. Chari Arespa Kachoga is a director for theater, film, multimedia, special events, and concerts. She is a theater educator around the world. She has directed and done musical staging for shows such as 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Amadeus, Rock of Ages, and The Full Monty. A director for creative development for Strong Edutainment, she's in the process of adapting a series of stories about a culturally diverse group of princesses slash superheroines called The Guardian princesses. She's converting these stories into musicals for young audiences. These musicals will be created using various creative methodologies and seek to incorporate multimedia and a variety of theatrical techniques and devices from the different cultures and traditions represented in the stories. Thanks so much for being here with us, Chari. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Please tell us a bit about your journey to becoming this theater powerhouse that you are today. <laughs> if only, right? Well, I started out I started out as an actor, Great. a student actor, mm-hmm. actually. The repertory company that I first joined and where I essentially got my training in would hold workshops. Okay. So we started out as students and then after those workshops, some of us auditioned to get into the company and then mm-hmm. I did. And so I was doing the repertory company all through my undergraduate years. Great. And I started out as an actor, but really I could see I was very interested in all the other aspects of putting the show together. Yes. And eventually about after a year of being in the company, the artistic director of that company also said, so this summer you're teaching. Oh, wow. I mean, she was a very formidable woman yes. that you did not say no to. Okay. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'm teaching. And then I figured out how to, yeah, how to, how teach. to teach. Yes. And really the teaching was how I learned to be a director. Oh, perfect. To, it's caring for like 40 50, 60 students at a yeah. time, putting them in a show, teaching them yes. the rudiments of performing on stage and getting that show together and making everyone look good. Oh, beautiful. Right. Yeah. Now, were you still a student when you started teaching? I was still a student. You still were I was, a student. I was a sophomore. A sophomore. Oh, years. wow. Yeah. Okay, so that happened early. Yeah, so now tell me, early. what was your major? Uh, <laughs> My original major was in industrial engineering. Okay. And uh, that was only because my mother filled out my um, (laughs) undergrad application forms Uh because she was worried I would write things down like literature or drama. (laughs) So she tried to pull the rug out from under me and did that. But after my first maybe semester in school <laughs> and we were doing math that had no more numbers right yeah I mean, it, it was, was like logarithmic math. things <laughs> i flipped to the back of the book and all the answers were there okay so i said why in heaven's name do we need to study this if someone answered these questions already <laughs> so i remember walking around my university actually the song you chose for the program makes me laugh because i walked around the university and i said what major can I change into? Okay. And I got drawn into a building that was playing music. I said, yeah. oh, that building sounds noisy. It sounds like fame. Maybe I'll walk in there oh and my check. Goodness. And it was, the, um, it was the College of Music. Okay. And I said, oh, I was hiding from my piano teacher in my youth. So maybe this is not the right place for me. And then I crossed <laughs> to the next building that was beside it. It was in the middle of the afternoon and these gaggle of people were dancing to Madonna's Vogue Mm. outside a classroom in the middle of the day. Sounds fun. So I said, oh, I'm just going to find something to do here. And then I looked at their roster of courses and, you know, it said film and audiovisual communication. I said, oh, I can do that. I'll just do this. Wow. And then I shifted. Yeah. So that was what? Multimedia studies? What was the name of that department? it, that was in the College of Mass Communication. Mass and communication. one of their majors was in film. And then it wasn't multimedia studies. It was still audiovisual communication. Wow. So he said, oh, I'll do this. 
And then so I was doing that while I was an actor in the repertory company. Okay, great. What did years. your mom say when she realized you were no longer an industrial engineer? Well, she only found out in the next enrollment period. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She looked at my forms and said, why am I paying for film stock? <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way. I forgot yeah. to mention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So sometimes just apologize after. Yes. Like, don't yes. ask permission. Don't ask permission. Yeah. Just do it and apologize <laughs> later. Okay. So you get this degree in mass communications. And what do you do with it when you graduate? Unfortunately, much to my mom's <laughs> consternation, yes. I decided I'll just keep doing theater anyway. Okay. So, you know, I was getting, you know, offers from advertising agencies okay. to go into all of that. And I said, oh, no, maybe I'll concentrate on doing theater just a little bit, okay. just a little bit more. So I kept doing that and I kept doing that. And I think, you know, a lot of the real turning point for me became when I started deciding I'd rather direct more than act. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You started thinking about yourself mm -hmm. more as a director mm -hmm. than an actual actor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what inspires your work as a director? Um, I have to say, because of how I started out as a director, a lot of my students inspire my work as a director. Mm -hmm. A lot of new young performers inspire a lot of it. Because, you know, you think of how do we help these people tell yeah. new stories, yeah. tell the stories they want to tell. How do they realize they can do things mm. more than what they're giving themselves yes, credit yes. for? Reach their potential. Right? Yes. Go, go exactly. harder. Go greater. Yes. Push themselves. Yes. Um, I have to say I've been very fortunate to also have worked with lots of great directors. Okay. Who have been very generous. You know, when you get to sit at the feet of masters at work, you just yeah. you just try and take in every second, oh, right? And soak it up. And like let that inspire you and let it roll over into either informing your work or figuring out how to pass that on to, yeah. to other people. Yeah. And right now, I think what inspires a lot of my work and interest in doing new stuff and mm -hmm. developing new things is, you know, the urgency of the times and the stories we need to tell. Tell us how, about that. Speak about it. Let's keep oh playing. We're goodness. at WBAI. Right, yeah. Why are the times urgent? And why well, do I mean, stories you know, need to be when, told? When the times and the political climate yeah. encourage divisiveness, yes. encourage like killing the arts, like that's it for yeah. humanity. If yeah. we kill the arts, how sure. do we learn about ourselves? How do we, you know, as we said earlier, how do we envision a better place yes. without the arts? That's yeah. so important, I think. And we, you know, we need to use this time yeah. to say important things and help people say the things that they want to say. Wow. Yeah. And in that vein, what do you believe has been sort of your greatest accomplishment with respect to your work as a theater director? As a theater director, I think, you know, I will have to say I'm still on the journey to that, that great accomplishment, okay. although I get very great, you know, pride and fulfillment in seeing some people I've trained go really good places. Oh, wow. That, yeah. is, that yeah. is a great sense of accomplishment. Yes. Yeah, because you see your work manifest. You were pushing the person to his or her limit, mm -hmm. and now the person and has it's not succeeded. about your work anymore. Yeah. Then they're able to do the work for themselves, yes, right? Yes, yes, and yes. succeed, yes. and sometimes succeed better than I'm succeeding, oh. which is <laughs> yes. great. Oh, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Wow. What have been the challenges? Um, hustling, and you know, find getting the next job okay. and getting the next job. That's 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 always a challenge. It's always uh, but you know, but those are practical logistics. Logistics, right? So you know, the challenge is always: what do I need to do so that my life can support the fact that I want to get to this rehearsal? Mm. I want to pick up that story and fix that into something. Mm -hmm. Which which collaborators do I find to do things with? Those are the bigger the bigger, bigger you know challenges. the bigger thoughts and then okay. you know the daily things are 
they are challenges, but you know, they're nitty gritties that we have to do. Comparatively, yes. but have you felt there've been any challenges emotionally in terms of the work or mentally, oh, I mean, spiritually, have you felt challenged? Absolutely. First of, you know, first of all, when the nitty gritties seem to overwhelm yes. you, that's, that's yes. difficult. You that's felt overwhelmed really at the time. Difficult. When the bills needed to be paid. And absolutely. Felt, okay. Absolutely. Okay. And you know, it does take a village like what, um, please tell us about Mike your village. said earlier, you know, tell us about this, your the same people, the, the great thing is, the same people who lovingly remind you yeah don't do this we'll also you know yeah cousins who say come stay with us or yeah you've been friends blessed. who say i've been very blessed with so, supportive you know, people yeah. who warned you not to do it told you stay in industrial engineering don't <laughs> yeah. go to that other building yeah. people but even friends, when you made yeah. that decision and you need a place to stay, they say, my house is open to you. Right. And sometimes it's not just, you know, it's not just a place to stay. Sometimes they're just the soft place to land where yeah. it's a bad day. Let's get a drink. Okay. You know, those things yeah, emotional matter. Support. And then when you find people who are also, you know, who are on the same kind of artistic journey. Yes. And maybe they're not having such an overwhelming time. And they become like the inspiration for keeping on going yeah right yes, that's yes, also yes. we'd like in the in a way that's how us artists can be there for each other uh, you, right you're speaking to what michael discussed too this sort of give and take right so you're giving of yourself you're helping these young people push themselves to their artistic limits you're mm -hmm. seeing them blossom so you're giving but you're also getting you're getting from family members who offer you a place to stay who offer you support you're getting from these wonderful artists who are in a similar predicament who say i understand i've been there who are helping you so you're in this virtuous circle i would mm -hmm. say of yeah. giving and getting absolutely and all of that just creates ripples beautiful right so when the work is out and we turn more people on to coming to the theater yes. more that's the reward yeah right yes, or yes, yes and even as we are doing it like the process of collaborating with other artists yes. who come and you know bring their stories to the table that's absolutely. the most thrilling part absolutely for me. so can you for the people listening because you have survived you look nice you know you have Thank a place you. to live you're not homeless <laughs> 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 we you had know, coffee you today. had coffee yeah, you're, you're good, eating right? food yeah. you know how are you because okay audience members in the pre-show conversation i found out that uh associate director or assistant director to a broadway play in new york city on broadway could be offered that position for 500 dollars a week not oh, not all not all but it's possible happens, yeah. and i was shocked i'm like a broadway show that i'm like seeing in times square and the person is making five hundred dollars a week so I, I did not even realize that the levels were like this and michael and chari in our pre-show conversation mentioned to me that yes they're offering five hundred dollars a week and they have people lined up to do it so if you don't accept it, there's somebody else who's equally talented, ready to take on that role. And I said, my goodness, how are people, especially maybe a single person might be able to somehow squeeze, manage, maybe. But how are people who are advanced in lives with family doing this? So please tell us, Chari, how are they doing it? What are you doing? How are you making it? Well, okay, I don't, I don't have a family. Okay. So, yes. you know. That helps. By choice, yes. <laughs> yeah. That helps a lot. Okay. That helps a yes. lot. Um, I, prior to doing my MFA, a lot of my theater life was subsidized by doing corporate events. People, are you listening? She, she leveraged her skills as a theater director to do corporate events. I okay, tell us how those skills And a overlap. lot of that was leveraging, like putting together what I was learning in film school. And mm -hmm. what I was doing as a theater director mm -hmm. and just putting it together to conceptualize like very like, complicated, high end, like high pressure, short deadline kinds of events. And when I say events, like my brand of events are very like theatrical, narrative driven, mm. but you're launching a product. And they're doing it for like it could be a new soft drink. Could be a new soft launch. drink. It's a theatrical could be event. a new something. Could be a new drink. Could be a new car. Okay. Could be an internal effort within the corporation. Mm. I mean, na like name it. Okay, <laughs> and you enjoyed that. I did enjoy it. You know that I love had it. a lot of challenges too. Yeah, very high pressure. You ha you're you have to be responsible for a lot 
of resources, but I was also very blessed to be to had had found a group of similar artists yeah. who could specialize in doing sets, could specialize in okay. doing that, and we would co- we collaborated yes. to create those things. And you know, we would always say. We just started this thing because we wanted to be by a beach during the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Look where we are now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So now this is a key. So one key step, people, let's make sure that we're understanding this. She leveraged her skill set in different venues. So you could just use your theatrical skills in Broadway theater in New York City. Or, or you could also do work for corporations Mm -hmm. because many of their events for product launches are like theaters. So that's one way you've been flexible and you've appealed to different markets, Mm -hmm. not just the theater market, but the corporate market. Any other tips? Um, I also teach. You also teach. Tell us about that. I teach. I do acting coaching or I teach. I teach. Sometimes I'm asked to lecture in universities. Yes. Uh, most recently, I've been quite challenged by, you know, being asked to lecture about things that are historical or, you know, based on cultural theory yes. and what I do. So I enjoy the process yes. as well. And so I turn more people onto the theater is like, for example, I was doing a history course specific to Filipino American historical relations. Mm-hmm. And I made all the points of departure shows from the theater in oh, different wow. time periods. So then through the theatrical piece we are learning about historical concepts cultural happenings and you realize too how closely and intricately woven the arts are with what happens in history with what happens in history current events etc absolutely and somehow using the power of the story Mm -hmm. in theater makes it a much more relatable real history so you see how you can place yourself in it and be a mover in it yes that's what i was hoping to do with the students hopefully it worked oh my no (laughs) this is wonderful this is really key information so she not only directs theater she also directs events for corporations additionally she teaches both on an individual level meaning she provides acting coaching if you come to her and you say i really need an acting coach she's there she will be able to make money that way and then additionally she teaches at group levels because she's a you are a visiting professor a visiting i'm a visiting scholar, scholar and yes. lecturer at mm-hmm. university of california at riverside mm-hmm. so these are the different ways in which she's been able to take her love of theater her love of acting and her skill set and been able to monetize it so that she can survive in very expensive places like New York and California. So that's amazing. Okay, very great. Tell us about your Guardian Princess work, please. Great. The Guardian Princess Alliance um, started a series of books um, called, you know, it's it's called the Guardian Princess series. And this was um, conceived as restructuring or showing us a new way to have princesses Mm -hmm. who are superheroines whose worth is not predicated on their beauty or how they look whose worth is not predicated on finding a prince wonderful but whose worth comes from them doing things for other people Mm -hmm. them doing things for the planet so they are superheroines who take care of the environment who work with each other mm-hmm. and who promote cross-cultural alliances alliances throughout. And um, one of the professors in University of California, Riverside, started this series, um, Professor Shigematsu. And um, th- they are now, we are now on our fifth book. Um, the fifth book is called Princess Leilani yeah. and the Lanu Tree. Now, through the years, they started getting interest from schools who wanted to do the shows as musical theater or mm, as theater, who wanted I to see. adapt the shows into musical theater. Um, because of how we want to protect the messaging yes. of the pieces. Yes. We decided, okay, let's try to do the adaptations ourselves so that when we get these inquiries again, we can just, you know, license those exactly, things to exactly. them. Exactly. So, um, and since Professor Shigematsu knew, like, my specialty, I do musical theater. I do theater. That's, you know, that's the main calling and <laughs> oxygen of <laughs> my life, life yes. really. Um, so, we talked about the possibility of adapting the whole series and. 
been maybe a couple of years since that first conversation. We are now in the process of adapting the first um, of the book series. We are adapting Princess Ten Ten and the Dark Skies into a musical for young audiences. I was very blessed to have found collaborators in the city. Their names are Maggie Herskovitz and... um, Jilly May Eddie. So it's a bi coastal, cross cultural, <laughs> cross everything indeed, like collaboration. The story. Yes. Yeah. I mean, thank God for Skype because yes. we are so dependent yes. on that technology. Um, so we are at it's still a de- it's still a development process. When do you think it'll be out? When do you think we'll be we able do, to go see this? We do our work. We do a workshop mm-hmm. of the initial piece at the end of May. Okay, coming up. Yes, coming up. And then after that workshop, we'll see what we need to tweak more. We'll see if we need to develop more things on it. And then we'll we'll see where that goes. We'll see if that's set. We'll see if... We, and then hopefully we'll, we'll find a grant to get it into a full production. Yes. And then license it out. I love it. I learned about you and the Guardian Princesses in looking for culturally responsive materials. So I am a vendor to New York City Public Schools and Nassau County Public Schools, Nassau County Public Schools, of uh, courses on to teachers, professional development cor- courses on culturally responsive education. So I'm constantly looking for literature that shows diverse heroes and heroines. So I looked up African American princesses and I found Princess, Princess Vinaya Vinaya. and the Gullivores. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's a book that I give to all of my relatives. It's a book that I teach. I recommend it in my professional development courses. And I and I also perform it as a storyteller. It's a beautiful story about a princess whose kingdom, unfortunately, is threatened by what we would, might say is a famine because all of the crops fail. And a mysterious man comes and offers these crops that... It's thinly veiled, but basically are genetic, genetically modified food. And she's mm-hmm. able to solve the day, create organic food, and everyone is fine afterwards. And she does it with the help with a, of a princess from another land. It's a beautiful, beautiful story, like all of the Guardian Princess stories. And as a mother, as a black mother, I appreciate your work. I appreciate the work of uh, Professor Shigematsu and making sure that all of our children are able to see themselves reflected in a positive way. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your support. We were thrilled when you reached out to us and we are looking forward to yes. more collaborations with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So please tell us how people can get in contact with you, whether they want acting lessons, whatever it is, or they just want to learn okay, more about I have, you. I have a website. I have a very challenging name. My <laughs> website is phonetically chari um, but if you look for me through the guardian princesses.org website you will link to my website and not get misspelled things that will lead you to you know all sorts of i don't know wikileaks pages <laughs> who knows um so you can find us on you can find me through guardianprincesses.org or through chari Perfect, perfect, perfect people. Check it out. Guardianprincesses.org. Thank you, Chari. Thank we you so much. We appreciate your wisdom. This concludes How to Make It in the City. We are grateful for the wisdom and experiences of both Michael L. Royce and Chari S. Berespa Kochaga. They have inspired us to believe that we can indeed make it in this city. Thanks for listening. I am your host, Ama Kari Kari Yawson, Esquire, author of Sune's Gift and Educator. I'd love to visit you, your corporation, your school. I'd love to get to know you better. So please feel free to contact me. My number is 347 347- 886-2026 and my email address is ama ama at wbai.org please support the uplifting work of this show and this station by becoming a wbai buddy go to www.wbai.org also please go to wbai.org to listen to our other episodes of how to make it in the city until next week i'm wishing you all love joy health peace and prosperity Be well, loved ones.